Good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Cervera, and I am the program manager for California Lawyers for the Arts San Diego. Myself, along with Sara Gonzalez, who is the co-organizer for this event, along with members of our statewide staff, including our executive director, Alma Robinson, and our deputy director, Gloria Ruiz Oster, are happy to welcome you to our third annual binational symposium, Intersections, Art and Law at the Border. Each year, we invite artists, activists, lawyers, scholars, and researchers to contribute their unique perspectives and expertise on various border topics, with a particular focus on issues affecting the geopolitical context of Tijuana, San Diego. The intention of this gathering is ultimately to highlight the work of those responding to border issues precisely at the intersection of art praxis and legal issues. Buenas tardes a todos, mi nombre es Diana Cervera y soy la gerente de programas con California Lawyers for the Arts San Diego. Mi co-organizadora, Sara González, y nuestra directora ejecutiva, Alma Robinson, conjunto con nuestra directora del sur de California, Gloria Ruiz Oster, y yo estamos contentas de darles la bienvenida a Intersections, Art and Law at the Border, nuestro simposio anual, donde invitamos artistas, activistas, académicos, investigados y e investigadores a contribuir sus perspectivas únicas sobre temas fronterizas. De esta región y más allá a otras localidades. We greet you today as visitors residing on the occupied lands and ancestral territories of the Kumeyaay Nation, past, present, and future. As we begin our conversation today, it is important to note that the Kumeyaay territory, also known as the San Diego Tijuana region, extends across the current US Mexico border along the Pacific Ocean from Oceanside, California to San Vicente, Mexico, and extends to the east from the Salton Sea to the Laguna Salada, including places now called Tijuana, Tecate, Mexicali, San Diego, and Escondido. The indigenous peoples of this land have always, and have always been and continue to be examples of how to be in relationship to one another, to both human and non-human beings. As a guest and a visitor on these lands, I extend my respects and gratitude to the many indigenous peoples who reside here and call these lands their home. Los saludamos hoy como visitantes en los territorios ancestrales de la nación Kumeyaay, pasado, presente y futuro. Es importante contemplar que el territorio Kumeyaay, también conocido como la región de Tijuana, San Diego, atraviesa la frontera de México y Estados Unidos por el mar del Pacífico hasta Oceanside, a San, San Vicente, México, y extiende del mar de Saltón hasta Laguna Salada, incluyendo a lugares hoy conocidos como Tijuana, Tecate, Mexicali, San Diego y Escondido. Las primeras naciones y las comunidades indígenas siempre han sido nuestro ejemplo de cómo estar en relación con la tierra y todos los seres humanos y no humanos. Como visitantes en estos territorios, ofrecemos nuestros respetos y damos gracias por el permiso de estar presente en este espacio. Once again, thank you all for being here with us this evening, and I look forward to the collective conversations we'll embark on together. Before we begin, I'd also like to thank our sponsors for this year's event, which include the firms of Shepard Mullen, Kate Brown and Bonesteel, Kahana Feld, and Paul Hastings. For those of you who are unfamiliar with CLA, we are a statewide nonprofit organization serving the arts community, providing legal support in a number of ways. To tell you a bit more of our services and organizational history, I'd like to play a video from our executive director, Alma Robinson, followed by a brief video welcome from Jonathan Gless, who is the director of culture affairs for the city of San Diego. De nuevo, bienvenida. A continuación, compartiremos dos videos cortos, uno de nuestra directora ejecutiva, Alma Robinson, y otro de Jonathan Gluss, que es el director de la ciudad de San Diego. Muchas gracias, y en un momento comenzará el webinar después de los videos. Hello, my name is Alma Robinson, and I am the executive director of California Lawyers for the Arts. CLA is a statewide nonprofit organization that was founded in 1974 to serve artists and arts organizations of all disciplines with advocacy as well as services that provide support with legal and business issues. With staffed offices in San Francisco, Berkeley, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego, we provide several core services. First, we provide legal counseling to specialized attorneys who provide assistance with a variety of intellectual property questions, as well as contract reviews and negotiations, 
and other important business issues. Depending on the client's financial status, legal assistance may be available on a pro bono or reduced fee basis. We also provide a specialized program that assists independent inventors and small startups with their patent applications. To help with situations involving disputes, we provide a range of alternative services, including negotiations counseling, mediation, and arbitration that can avoid the expense and hassle of going to court. Finally, we offer a full menu of educational programs that include workshops, symposia, and conferences on various legal topics for artists and arts organizations. Many of these programs are posted on our YouTube channel, and we encourage you to use these tools to educate yourself on the legal issues before you reach out for specialized assistance from our organization. Thank you for joining today's program, and please consider joining CLA on our website at www.calawyersforthearts.org so that we can continue to maintain our full range of services. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Gloss. I'm the Director of Cultural Affairs for the City of San Diego. And I have the great honor of welcoming you to Intersections 2021. First, if you are joining us from San Diego, it's great to see you virtually here again. And if you're joining us from Hong Kong, Europe, South America, elsewhere in North America, welcome to San Diego. And we look forward to having you here in San Diego in person next year. If you're not familiar with San Diego, we are a wholly unique place in that we share with the city of Tijuana the privilege of residing on the lands of the Kumeyaay Nation, who were here well before the state of California, the United States, Baja California, Mexico. We take that privilege seriously and we honor and thank the Kumeyaay for the privilege of being on this land. We also, in the city of Tijuana and the city of San Diego, work very closely together because we know that we're economically connected. But more importantly, we are culturally connected. We often say that we are one city in two countries. Sometimes we'll say we are siblings who sometimes get get along and sometimes we don't. But in the big picture of things, we work very closely together to advance this special region into its future that only looks brighter. I want to thank California Lawyers for the Arts for producing intersections, and actually I should say conceptualizing and producing intersections. Not only does it provide an opportunity for us to thoughtfully bring together academics and other thought leaders, on the ground community leaders, scientists, and artists and creatives of all types to really consider this border region, how it benefits us, how it challenges us, and how it can only be better. Intersections has also been a, a opportunity to elevate this unique place and have discussions among similar border regions across the world. We only learn and improve from each other's successes and each other's failures. So I wanna thank California Lawyers for the Arts for their insight into making this truly an international initiative. So I wanna close by thanking California Lawyers for the Arts again, and I want to welcome all of you who are calling in from all over the world to this beautiful region called San Diego, Tijuana, Baja, California. We love it here, and we know you will as well. Take good care, and I look forward to crossing paths soon. Thank you so much. And to introduce our panel today, our inaugural panel, Border History, a political context of the Tijuana-San Diego borderlands, I'd like to invite Sara Gonzalez, who is the Special Projects Coordinator for California Lawyers for the Arts. 
San Diego to introduce our panel and our panelists for today. Thank you, Sara. Thank you, Diana, for that warm welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. As Diana already mentioned, tonight's panel, we will be focusing and it will provide a political history of the Tijuana-San Diego border region. It will map the various historical events and legislations that have shaped the region into what it is today. Panelists will contextualize the various organizing efforts within the region and drawing from archival newspapers and political documents to make critical connections between the present and the past. And tonight's stellar panel includes Justin Akers Chacon, who's professor at San Diego City College. We also have Silvia Fernandez and Mayra Alvarez from Borderlands Archives Cryptography. And our last panelist tonight will be Tom Holm, who is the executive director and principal science officer of the Kumeyaay Heritage Preservation Council. And to start off our event tonight, as we mentioned, we have Justin Akers Chacon. He is a professor and the chair of the Chicano Chicana Studies Department at San Diego City College. He teaches Chicano Chicana history and specializes in labor, border, and immigration studies. He has published three books in that field, and he is also an activist for police abolition within his union, AFT Local 1931, and for ICE Detention Center and Border Wall Abolition as part of the San Diego County-based Free Them All Coalition. Justin, welcome. Please feel free to share a bit more about your work and with tonight's audience before you begin your presentation. Hello, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you for the invitation to be part of this important panel and discussion. I think I was, you covered me pretty well. <laughs> thank you for that. So I'd like to go into my presentation and use some images as a, a sort of guide through a little bit of the history of specifically the San Diego Tijuana border region, which is where I'm situated here in the South County of San Diego. Let me, let me start by saying that where, where are we? In terms of the, the question of immigration, borders, enforcement, you know, repression, detention. Where are we at, the, at this moment? And it's a pretty bleak, it's a pretty bleak moment that we're in indeed. This is a, a photo I took on May 1st, a few days ago. This is in front of the San Diego Convention Center. And I was part of a car caravan that was doing a rally in support of the 1,450 plus migrant and refugee children that are currently incarcerated in, the, in this center as part of the most recent effort, in this case by the Biden administration, to deal with refugees and asylum seekers on our border. And I have this sign, Free Them All, which is an expression, you know, a clear uh, political statement that these children should not be incarcerated, that the policies that have led to them to be in this situation are an affront not only to human rights, but, but actually to policy as it existed prior to the Trump administration, which was that the United States allowed for uh, uh, asylum seekers at the port of entry to claim asylum and pursue a process for uh, achieving refugee status. So this is kind of where we're at. And so what I'd like to do is go a little bit back through some of the chapters of history that have led to this crisis. And, and, and I think it's important for us to, un to understand that as a crisis. But I want to start way back. I want to start back in the colonial period. You know, we're honoring the fact that we're on Kumeyaay land. And this is a way of even understanding the current U.S.-Mexico border itself. Looking at a, a, a map of the indigenous nations and populations as they exist today, we see that the border, the U.S.-Mexico border, actually divides, dissects, separates the populations that have that have always been here, the original populations. And it's also important to point out that the U.S.-Mexico border, right, if we look at it as a not just a, a signifier of a separation between two nations, but of course a barrier, a reinforced wall, a militarized space, the actual location of that border itself is, it's, is a reflection of how far the colonial project, the Spanish colonial project, was able to penetrate into what is today the United States. So that line of designation is actually where conquest ended and where indigenous resistance and indigenous efforts to su sustain their communities in the face of colonization were successful in, in sort of stopping the forward march. So the border is, is in many ways, has uh, originally a site of colonial and anti-colonial conflict and I would argue today continues in various ways to, to be a perpetuation of that. And so a couple broad swaths of understanding, you know, where, you know, the, the sort of historical framework for where we're at. One is, is understanding economics, because 
the border isn't just a fixed static zone. It's, it's an interface between two countries. Uh, really, it's an interface between the United States and the rest of the hemisphere. And it is a place where, for instance, today, if we look at pre-pandemic, but continuing today, you know, something like three quarters of a billion dollars of commerce cross each day, right? So when we talk about the border being some kind of dividing line, it isn't really essentially a dividing line for everybody or end everything. It really does function only to, to restrict the movement of a very small population of people. In fact, the U.S.-Mexico border crossing point that's closest to me, just a few minutes south of where I am, is one of the busiest you know, crossing points in the world. And on, a, on an average year, there might be uh, between 200 and 300 million crossings that are authorized. Only about 1% of the actual crossings are prohibited. And that's people who don't have documentation or, and more recently, people attempting to cross as asylum seekers. But if we look at this map, we see that starting really after World War II and reaching a high point in the late 1960s, the United States was at the center of a rebuilding of the global economy through its role as the, you know, the primary economic power emerging from World War II. And so by 1967, you know, according to, to documentation here, the United States controlled nearly 60% of global trade in terms of in making investments around the world. And this, you know, started through the rebuilding of those economies that were destroyed by World War II. But then later, we're going to see in the 1960s and 70s, it was then using these international agencies to essentially open up closed or protected economies like Mexico, like in Central America and South America, through the ages of debt restructuring. In the 1970s and 80s, where there's going to be debt crises, and this U.S.-centric economic model is going to leverage U.S. economic power to compel countries like Mexico to begin to open up their economies to U.S. foreign investment. And this is going to be one of the major factors driving economic displacement starting in the 1980s, especially. It's also important to point out that over the same period of time, we're going to see the expansion of the U.S. as a, as a, as a military power. And this is also going to have a direct bearing on immigration and immigration enforcement. So as to, by today, you know, the numbers vary depending on how one analyzes military presence. But there are mil U.S. military bases or installations of some sort in you know, over several hundred in the world, over, you know, in over 100 countries. And so this expansion of U.S. military power is going to have a significant impact on U.S. foreign policy. But also we're going to see that foreign policy is going to also influence domestic policy and ultimately influence the development of immigration and border policy. And so I share here a picture of a person by the name of Joseph Swing. Joseph Swing on the left here, he was a lifelong military person, served in both world wars. And one of his crowning achievements was the recapturing of the U.S. colony of the Philippines during World War II, the retaking of that U.S. colony, colonial possession from the Japanese during the war. In 1954, he retired from the military and was appointed by Dwight D. Eisenhower to head up the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Now, this is very important to understand a military general moving from, you know, commanding military forces. And after World War II, we're going to see that this is, you know, at the heart of and driving, you know, the sort of Cold War foreign and domestic policy. So this military figure is now going to take charge of the Immigration and Naturalization Service and essentially apply a military framework to addressing immigration at that time. And between 1954 and 1962, which was his tenure, over that same exact period, he oversaw the execution of, an, of a mass deportation program, primarily of Mexican nationals. And I only say the name because it it's the, was the official name, but it was a, a racial epithet referred to as Operation Wetback. Um, that was the name of the, mili the militarized immigration policy to, you know, to essentially remove millions of Mexican nationals from the United States using uh, military-style operations. So between 1954 and 1962, you know, over 4 million Mexican nationals were deported. And it's important to also point out here that in the documentation of his congressional reports, he emphasized that Mexicans and communists were crossing the border, crossing the border and, and penetrating into the United States. In the context of the Cold War, we see how, how this militarization and, and immigration enforcement model are going to be ref reflective of 
of Cold War policy and Cold War logic. And so we see that starting really in 1954 and 1962, laying the foundation of what we we see today, which is a a military strategy, one grounded in these military uh, theoretical frameworks of containment, which is stopping the you know, stopping the spread of something. Another term that's used in the literature is perimeter defense. The idea that U.S. participation in the world through the through economic means, through military means, through political means, makes the United States a threat to, a supposed threat to people, you know, coming into the United States to do harm, first with communists, and then we're going to see it's going to progress through different further elaborations of foreign policy, from the war on drugs to the war on terror. We see this process of militarizing the border is going to also take another form in the 1980s, especially under the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, uh, 1983-88, when we see increased U.S. political, military, and and diplomatic intervention into conflicts in in Central America, and the direct funding of U.S.-aligned regimes in places like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and others. And we see the way in which immigration enforcement itself, first through the Border Patrol and later through through ICE and other auxiliary Department of Homeland Security agencies, are going to incorporate another type of Cold War strategy, the the Latin American, especially Central American Cold War strategy of anti-guerrilla military intervention, which is referred to in in military terms as low-intensity conflict, the the creation of conflict zones. So the border, the border region of the United States becomes designated by the federal government as a kind of separate region where constitutional guarantees are not, there's a lot of limitations essentially on constitutional rights. uh, It's declared a kind of security zone that's governed by a different set of national security doctrines. This was a strategy in, in many ways that was articulated in places like School of the Americas, which is in Fort Benning, Georgia, which essentially was a training ground for many Latin American military personnel who applied these the strategies of repression of guerrillas and associated guerrillas and allies of guerrillas to their repression, essentially, of, of, of political movements, dissident movements, social movements, labor movements, and farm worker movements. So low intensity conflict then becomes a kind of governing doctrine of the border. So if you cross, you know, through the US-Mexican border in Tijuana, you, you, you'll see that it's a very militarized space. It's a place where you can see a very significant shift in how U.S. immigration officials interact with people within a 25-mile zone of the border. You know, there's a lot more, there's different sort of demarcations of zones where immigration officials can act according to these specific doctrines around national security. Okay, now there's another element to understanding that sort of dovetails and intertwines with the sort of foreign policies and, and the sort of initiatives abroad and how they impact domestic policy. So starting in, in the late 1960s, for instance, we and continuing in many ways up to the present, we see this conception of, of the United States as being impacted by the entrance of drugs, the war on drugs, as it's going to be, come to be known. And the war on drugs you know, has many facets, one of, one of which is mass incarceration that begins essentially under the administration of Richard M. Nixon, is going to be intensified by virtually every president up to the present in some way. But specifically during the administration of of Reagan and Bush, we see the war on drugs beginning to take on a kind of border character specifically. And in 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which had these two elements to it, one is, you know, one is a negotiated amnesty, which actually led to the legalization of, of 3 million people, workers, which I'll come back to in a minute. The other side was the was shifting resources now towards border enforcement against drugs. And this was, again, embedded in the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which was signed by Ronald Reagan. I also want to point out the militarization of immigration enforcement also occurred within the U.S. military itself. In 1983, for instance, there was a report that came out of the U.S. Naval War College that was submitted to the U.S. Congress that was titled Immigration and the National Interest. And it it laid out an overview of the growing and impending threat of immigration to the United States. Now, one might ask, why is the Naval War College, right, driving discussion on immigration enforcement? And I would argue that, you know, that it had been part of the sort of military purview going back, you know, to the to what I talked about previously. And so the military has had a consistent orientation towards this idea of perimeter defense, towards the idea of, of protecting the U.S. from external threats. 
And so in, in this 1983 report, the author of this document reflecting, you know, the, the kind of leadership of the Navy, at least those represented at the War College, identified that from their point of view, that the growth of immigration at that time was, be, was producing a threat that would overwhelm law enforcement as it exists. And according to their recommendations, two of their major rec recommendations, the first being there needs to be the expansion of interior enforcement. And they, you know, basically not just the Border Patrol, but we need, according to them, a whole other police force across the country, a whole other parallel, you know, system of policing and incarceration that's going to be specifically designed for immigrants. I interestingly enough, they, they also say, well, we, we want we want immigrant workers. <laughs> we, we recognize the importance of immigrants to the U.S. economy, and they they also suggest maybe a, a kind of a guest worker or a new bra bracero program, uh, but they they don't recommend legalization. That's not a, a, a component of what they're what they're talking about. So this idea that we need interior enforcement, they also suggest creating a system of employer checks in which a federal database of some sort where employers would have to register all of their employees. And this is interesting because this is these, you know, these things, border enforcement, interior enforcement, workforce enforcement are all going to be part of that larger package of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. And so we see that the, you know, military, at least military theorists in many ways are driving the narrative. The war on drugs after the Cold War, well, even before it's over, but as it's transitioning towards its end in 1991, we see the Bush administration now beginning to emphasize the idea of the war on drugs, not just being a domestic issue, but an international issue and signing, you know, several provisions, bills, et cetera, that extend U.S. military anti-drug efforts into towards interdiction, towards the idea of going and stopping drugs where they're being produced. And this, this begins a longer process of U.S. military Latin American collaboration that today, you know, we see in many countries, the U.S. military has a presence in many countries in Latin America, the idea being to stop, to stop drugs. And under Bill Clinton, we see further expansion of this idea of the war on drugs expressing itself in different ways, the first of which was Operation Gatekeeper. And so in 1994, the Clinton administration oversaw the implementation of a series of kind of piecemeal border militarization projects that went by different names, today generally referred to as Operation Gatekeeper, which began the process of walling off, you know, first with, you know, these kind of, interestingly enough, military landing strip from the Iraq war, from the first Iraq war in the early 90s. And so where I live, for instance, the first phase of this, I remember before this existed, but the first phase was building a 14 mile wall. And again, military surplus landing strips from the Iraq war 91 and the invasion of Kuwait and then the push into Iraq, that military operation uh, led to the wall being built. And so it, it essentially Operation Gatekeeper was the idea that we're gonna build a wall to stop the flow of drugs. That was the primary language of, of, of the bill that was passed that resource to this. And then later we're gonna see, you know, of course the wall gets expanded. And then there's a, the first there's a double wall over, the, over a couple of years, there's gonna be a double wall, then a triple fence. It's gonna go 14 miles and then pretty soon it's gonna extend as sort of barriers in the, in the traditional, what are traditionally have been the main crossing points of undocumented people across the U.S.-Mexican border, or of, of people crossing the borders. It's important to point out that this strategy was was which was de developed through what was you know, what was the INS at the time was designed to be a deterrent. You know, the idea is that the wall is going to stop people from crossing. But what it ended up doing was merely moving migration out into more deadly regions and pushing migrant corridors out into through the Tecate Mountains through the, 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 the deserts of Arizona, through difficult terrain, crossing rivers in Texas, and there's gonna be a significant increase in the number of deaths. So in 1994, for instance, 23 migrants died before the wall was built, tragically. They died primarily by being hit by cars along the five freeway running from that connects Tijuana to San Diego because people would typically cross where transportation corridors exist to get to where they want to go. Starting in 1995 and exploding to this day, averaging about 400 deaths per year, people 
you know, die now in the deserts of dehydration. They die of uh, hypothermia crossing through the mountains. They drown in large numbers crossing um, various bodies of water in Texas. And so this human rights catastrophe is not really monitored, just like police shootings and police killings is not really monitored by the federal government. But human rights campaigners and researchers estimate well over 10,000 people have died as a result of this policy, yet it's it's still the official policy in place. Okay, so just mapping through more of this, 1996, Bill Clinton signs a piece of two pieces of legislation that are going to be very important for understanding militarization and increased repression of migrants and refugees. The 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which basically significantly increases the range of alleged or convicted crimes undocumented people can be deported for. And so we see, just to put it put it bluntly, we see the beginning of a process of expanding the sort of catalog of, of, of for reasons for people can be deported if they're if they're you know undocumented and caught. And then and then it just it, all the way to Trump, it just the range just widens and widens and the you know the the parameters enable more and more deportations. This bill that was signed into law by Clinton, you know, and passed through Congress also had a clause that allowed for police to engage in supplementary support for immigration enforcement. And so we, we see, uh, I forget the number, I think it's 287G is the name of the stipulation in that bill. We also see another bill being passed that effectively eliminates all access to all immigrants, undocumented and documented to practically all public services, social services, specifically welfare programs. So we see, you know, a, a kind of general political trajectory towards criminalization, deportation, expansion of the immigration agencies, uh, etc. And and on the right there, what you see George Bush and the current president, Joe Biden, allies in organizing Iraq war. The Iraq war is also well, let me go back and say 9-11, specifically the passage of the Patriot Act. There's a lot to, lot to cover. The Iraq war is going to be a, a significant boost for border enforcement. I've collected through the, through the years of that period of time, I collected a lot of political documents like uh, mailers from po politicians and recorded a lot of newscasts. There were constant claims that Iraqi agents were crossing the border. You know, so this idea that the border is, you know, an entry point for people who want to do harm to the United States then justifies the expansion of the border wall. So under, by, by the time Bush was, was in, uh, in office in 2000, between 2000 and 2008, the border wall, which by that point had covered up to about 100 miles of actual barrier and, and, and sort of enforced blockades of you know, anything moving across the border that had extended to over 600 miles. Okay, and we see various other acts, including over, we see the, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security in 2003, which begins to the, the rapid expansion of immigration enforcement. So going back to the suggestion of, of the Naval War College of, in, of increased interior enforcement, we see the bifurcation of enforcement now, the Border Patrol and Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. And Immigration and Customs Enforcement is, you know, it's going to be very important for understanding why deportations increase. Deportations had already existed under Clinton, but they're going to rapidly expand under Bush and then later under under the presidency of Obama. Here's Obama signing a, a bill in 2010, which doubled the number of border patrol agents and exponentially increased the funding for ICE. And so we see, you know, a continuity. And so by the time of the end of the Obama administration, there were over 3 million people removed or deported from the United States, which earned you know him the name deporter in chief by immigrant rights and uh, social justice activists. The, the other thing I want to point out, though, is going back to why people immigrate, you know, the convergence of these various factors. In 1994, the Democrats under Bill Clinton, in line with the Republicans, you see uh, a bipartisan consensus. And then in 2005, under, again, under both political parties under Bush, the U.S. government signed into, into law the North American Free Trade Agreement, 1994, in the Central American Free Trade Agreement in 2005. And it's important to understand that these, these policies, and we can talk more about this if, if people wanted to, to discuss it, these policies essentially go back to what I talked about, US seeking to create new markets 
for capital export, you know, for investors seeking to, you know, find ways to make more profit outside of its own borders. By the end of the 1990s, the United States, you know, near about 40% of all profits that were made by U.S. companies and U.S. investors were international, going back to that sort of global system I talked about. And so in a place like Mexico and Honduras, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in in the Caribbean and Haiti and the Dominican Republic, you have these capital investments called maquiladoras, which are, you know, there's in Mexico, there's several thousands of these and, you know, they exist all through the region. And these essentially are the product of NAFTA, really. I mean, they, they predate NAFTA, but they expand dramatically under this free trade agreement, which basically eliminates Mexico's traditional protective economic tariff wall and constitutional guarantees um, to use Mexico's natural economy to meet the needs of Mexicans. So starting in 1994, accelerating by 2008, when all of the impl- all the stipulations of NAFTA went into effect, we see millions of Mexican workers in, in, Mex- in Mexico now working at, first these were assembly plants, where they would, where U.S. companies would send goods to Mexico to, to profit from the, the cheaper labor there and then sell the goods back in the United States. But, but the, the arrangement became so profitable that U.S. companies and international companies have essentially moved whole production, industrial production centers uh, across Mexico. And so it's important to point out that these 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 uh, maquiladoras have extremely low wages. There's no union representation. The Mexican government at the state and, you know, at the uh, until recently has uh, at the federal level has been very complicit in keeping wages low to attract international investors. And so this is one aspect of why people become displaced, because not only are the wages low, but they're, they're now shifting whole, not just production, but they're shifting retail. They're shifting, like, for instance, Walmart is the largest employer in Mexico. So as foreign capital comes in, it, t- it dominates markets. It displaces smaller competitors. This happens across virtually all industries. And of course, in agriculture and in Mexico, many of these places I previously mentioned had a strong agricultural sector. NAFTA, for instance, is going to lead to the dissolution of over 25,000 state-owned farms overnight. People are basically going to lose access to their lands. And so this is a way of understanding why, although some people profit from this arrangement, it, it, it creates a very unequal, more, more unequal society where wealth flows to the top, but for workers and, and campesinos, It's basically, it ends their way of life, right? And so many, many have to migrate. So this is happening in phases. So between 1994, at the point of implementation of NAFTA in 2008, when the final agricultural stipulations removing the final tariffs on things like corn were finally implemented, it's about 7 million people that are displaced from Mexico, most of whom go to the United States, although some go to Canada. And so we see significant surge of migration through the 90s and early 2000s. Now, uh, CAFTA, which affects Central America, goes into effect in 2005. It's 2006. And by 2010, we began to see a lot of migration coming out of Central America, reaching a high point, you know, uh, well, actually, it, the high point has, is still being reached. Guatemala is the latest country that has the last, largest out migration to the United States. And it's not just people, you know, the political turmoil created by this opening up of these economies is reflective in these societies, even to the present. In 1994, displaced indigenous farmers, communal farmers and small farmers in the state of Chiapas organized a a, a rebellion against the implementation of NAFTA. And, you know, to, to this day are still organizing to defend land rights, cultural rights, referred to as the Zapatistas. In Honduras, one of the largest sending countries where the largest, if we look at the current policy that is being retained, mostly retained by Biden, which is not allowing asylum seekers to come in. Most of the people stuck in limbo in Mexico, waiting to get the right to apply for asylum are from Honduras. And Honduras has been a site of significant conflict ever since the implementation of the Central American Free Trade Agreement. And in fact, their president in 2000 was overthrown in 2009 because uh, a president who was critical of the of the, the effects of, of free trade, as, as it's referred to, and its displacing effects, his name was Manuel Salai and was overthrown. And the government that was installed by the military after that has more or less been in place. And in the last year, couple of years, there's been significant political turmoil and conflict. There's been a lot of oppression. 
as people protest those policies. And so the current president is Juan Orlando Hernandez. And this picture was from about a year ago. This was a uh, protest led by healthcare workers and education workers, because as, as part of the kind of wave of free trade implementation, we see the most recent had been privatization of parts of the, of the small but significant healthcare system and privatization of the public school system. Haiti also in this kind of array, in, in this network of, of free trade agreements also has been in turmoil over policies associated with its government. So we can see that this is a kind of a global process in which people are being displaced, they're migrating, or they're resisting the policies that are leading to their displacement. And a lot of all of this sort of re- goes back to, you know, the, the changes in foreign dom- and domestic policies, specifically coming from the United States. So I want to wrap up here by saying immigration in the United States has become a major issue for now for a long period of time. It's a permanent fixture in political discourse. Immigrant and migrant workers have been at the forefront of advocating for justice for themselves and their families. 2006, the millions of people took to the streets to call for a legalization, recognizing that, you know, their work is valuable, their commitment to our society is valuable, and that they shouldn't be criminalized. This has had various manifestations, the dreamer struggle, you know, those acting against detention centers, etc. But the current political system remains intransigent to substantive change. And I, and I would argue that part of that has to do with the economics of migration now becoming so important to the U.S. economy because immigrant, migrant, refugee workers make up statistically between 17 and 24% of the population in the United States. And out of the workforce, it would be a much higher percentage. Numbers aren't precise. They're estimates based on you know, researchers trying to track using different techniques. But we are in this situation. So even where people are in places like the convention center, this is not a picture of the convention center, but this is a picture coming out of Dallas at the K. Bailey Hutchinson Detention Center. Essentially, people are incarcerated and they're, and they're incarcerated inside these, in this case, these child detention, these child facilities and, and kind of stuck in limbo. And one of the challenges as, as the legal side of accommodating, you know, a large number of people who are seeking refugee status is inhibited by the fact that there's been so much cuts to the, to the sort of legal apparatus to administer that process. And so it creates these kinds of these kind of circumstances, these kind of crises circumstances. And besides that, the growth of the detention industry itself has become a profitable enterprise. This is the Otay Mesa Detention Center here in San Diego, which is run by a private corporation. So I'm going to conclude just by saying this political issue has tremendous human cost. It continues to rage. It continues to, to severely impact people on, on the, all sides of the border. And so, you know, this is why, you know, organizations, in some cases, immigrant-led, in some cases tied to unions, in other cases community-based, have consistently been organizing in the borderlands, in cities where detention centers are housed or situated, and in towns across the country where people are taking action to to call for, you know, immigration reform, to call for the dismantling of ICE, to call for the opening of the border for refugees and asylum seekers, and, you know, for, for for people to cross the border, you know, to pursue the right to work, the right to live, the right to be free, because after all, in many cases, the reason they're migrating has something to do with what's happening here in the United States. So thank you very much. I'll conclude there, and I hope this can spark some discussion. Thank you so much, Justin, for that presentation. As you mentioned, in addition to your work as a professor and a researcher and a scholar, I know that you are active in many of these efforts. Now I'd like to invite our next panelist. Silvia Fernandez is the Public and Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Research Fellow with the Hall Center for Humanities and the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Kansas. Her research and teaching intersect with US-Mexico border literature, archives, language, and cultures intersectional and transnational feminisms, mapping geospatial studies and post-colonial digital humanities. Welcome, Silvia. And along with Silvia, we have Dr. Mayra E. Alvarez, is one of the founders of Borderlands Archives Cartography, a transnational digital archive that records geographic locations of 19th and mid 20th century newspapers from both sides of the US-Mexico border. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Before we start, we would like to thank the California Lawyers for the Arts for inviting us to the symposium and of all of you for accompanying us for this panel. 
My name is Mayra Alvarez and my colleague Silvia Fernandez. Both of us will be presenting about the project Borderlands Archives Photography. And at this time, I would like you to invite you to visit the website so you can explore the material that we're going to be talking about and also follow us on social media for any updates or upcoming events that we'll be participating in. And this project, it's a project that emerges from our personal experiences within border communities. As fronterizas, our experiences, as well as our academic formation, led us to create this project in early 2017. Borderlands Archives Photography, or BAP, as we refer to it by its acronym. It's a project that consists of a digital map, which displays the U.S.-Mexico border newspapers photography, the records, geographic locations of 19th and mid-20th century periodicals, resulting in the documentation of the geographic location of the publishing newspaper establishment as well. And Silvia is going to talk a little bit more about that. So the objective is to bring the, to the forefront the history of the borderlands and its communities before and after the current division line was established. Now, before I dive into the, the, the project, it is important to note that the painting was the first introduced to the Americas in 1533, 14 years following the arrival of the Spaniards to the region known as Mexico, the persisting prevailing perception is that the United States has always been the neighbor, leading innovator, and dominant producer of cultural advancements. But that is not the case. Those inhabiting the Southwest have been practicing literary production and self-documentation that predates the birth of the United States. And in the borderlands, these cultural interactions gave rise to new identities as a result of loss of territory, immigration, exile, deterioration, transborder flows, and transnational dynamics. So with this in mind, Beck approaches the archival material, such as newspaper, according to the historical context that it's subjected to. And that is to say that we are aware that we are in indigenous lands, and our view of the borderlands for this project is from the content surrounding the newspapers. So we, uh, we let the newspapers create the visualizations as you will see in a moment. So in regards to the border communities, as a fronteriza, it is very important. I grew up hearing a single story, the one that it came from the national discourse. And to me, that was always problematic. So, and Chimamanda Adichie talks about this, the problem of a single story that creates stereotypes and those who have grown in the, grow up or lived in the border know very well about this and we can see it on our daily media. So for us, through this project, through the archives, but also through technology, digital tools, such as digital maps, like Ruby Garisan mentions, help us to intervene the digital cultural record to tell new stories by using this archival material and share our own knowledge, approach that material through our, our own personal knowledge. But we know the border is also about and not just what the media wants to feed us. So with this in mind, the project takes historical context. And for this particular material, which again, the materials were dictated, how the material was going to be distributed, visualized, and so on. We selected three historical periods, and we know that there's, of course, more events that are important and play a big role in terms of the current division line to that mobility that occurred from you know, the arrival of all of these empires. So for back protocols, period number one would be 1808 to 1846. That is newspapers that had been published during these years. And the map on the right, it's from an 1847 that was used for the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So with this in mind, it's to have a view of what the territory looked at that time. And so this newspaper is from this period. What they do is they document the end of the Spanish colonial empire in the Americas hemisphere and the Mexican War of Independence from 1810 to 1821 and what brought the political and territorial instability and that um, mobility of the division line. So the in, in regards to the newspapers that we have, in Back's case, we have a 1808 newspaper, which is the oldest newspaper that we have in Spanish language, and it was published in New Orleans in Mississippi, that it was recovered in the United States. Now, that's important to note that it's in the United States, and it has a title in Spanish. And then the second period would constitute the Mexican-American War, the 1847 to 1854. Again, this is based on the newspapers that we have gathered up to now. 
and that is subject to change at some point. So with this map, what you're seeing is we have the blue line highlights the territory that we just saw on the previous map, just to get an idea how that division line is moving due to the conflicts that are rising in, in, in between Spain and, Spain and what is now uh, Mexico, what came to be Mexico. So period number two, it's, as you can see, move further down and includes the states of California, New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. And of course, because we're talking about borderlands newspapers, we're talking about the northern states. So this is what we consider in terms of archives and borderlands newspapers in regards to the project, of course. So this period, it focuses on the military occupation in uh, Mexico. Some of you might not know, but what led to this loss of territory was was particularly that, that the U.S. military reached the capital and practically was about to lose the, the whole country. And also due to British money brokers, Mexico owed some money to the British Empire and it had weakened Mexican army due to all the battles that it was fighting to protect the territory and the constant change of government. We had multiple precedents at that time. So there was a lot of instability being a new nation or trying to become a new nation. So this of course led to that ceded territory. So newspapers from this period, that's what they, they document, that instability and, and the new boundary. And then on period number three, we selected the years 1855 and 1930. The 1930 is due to the copyright for archival material, and that's the only purpose, but we are aware that there's, of course, more newspapers after that. And this period is newspapers, what they do is they highlight the bilateral relationships between the U.S. and Mexico. And also due to the revolution in 1910, Mexican Revolution, 1910 to the 1920s, and the First World War in 1917, what that brought was also physical barriers and uh, enforcement of militarization and, or at least, armed men along the border. So more regulations. But again, the newspapers, what they mostly show is that bi-national relationships in terms of economic politics and so on. So what these three maps show is that, again, what the newspapers have shown us in terms of data and information. So what we do in the project with the newspaper year publication helps us to start to define what was considered as the borderlands region and determine how newspapers will be selected, categorized, and organized. And the project protocols established on historical periods that allow the selection of states to be included. So we had to limit the information because we could, you know, spend so many years just going through the archives. And since the oldest newspaper that dates back to the 1808 in our data, states further through the north are also considered as well, such as Colorado, as we saw on the first map, Nevada, and Utah. So what back currently considers for the 19th century newspaper. The protocol includes 19th century newspapers from all states in Mexico and the United States, while those of the 20th century are selected according to the current border cities. And this is due to the fact that the border between the U.S. and Mexico, as we saw, has gone through geographical and political transitions that establish what is known as the current border. When we started this project, we were aware that maps and archives are colonial tools and that they were created to control the production of knowledge of the territories that oversee the empires. But as if we were to take control of those tools as individuals or communities, we can restructure, we can retell that and recreate that story and that single story that I mentioned and use this tool to contest that colonial cultural record. So what the project objective is and what we have done since 2017 is to locate, map and facilitate the access to newspaper archives of the national region as a way to rep repossessing our heritage by feeling the lacune of the official, let me say that in quotes, history and recovering the multiple legacies of our experiences. So with this in mind, I will let Celia to explain a bit more how we do that through the archives and material that we have gathered for back. Thank you, Mayra. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. What Mayra just mentioned was the different histories, the different intersections that form what we call right now the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And throughout Borderlands Archives cartography, 
three of the main objectives that are part of the project are locating, mapping, and facilitating the access of newspaper in order to understand those intersectionalities that have formed the identities of the border, as well as to understand the different transitions that have passed since 1808 to 1930. When speaking about locating, it is important to consider what are we locating. And in Borderlands Archives cartographies, we see the borderland La Frontera as an interstitial region between Mexico and the United States that has been delineated by its various border shifts, yet maintaining fluid dynamics among nation states. Perhaps one of the best known descriptions of the Mexico-US border is Gloria Sansaldúas, who refers to the region as an open wound, una herida abierta, where the third wall grates against the first and bleeds before a scar forms, it emerges again the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. This metaphor drawn predominantly from a US perspective, but the third country to which she alludes, it's formed on a complex system of coexistence networks shaped by migrants and border communities. So taking that into consideration, we adapted what Debra Castillo and Maria Socorro Tabuenca propose as it is important to take both sides. This also reflected also in the identities of Mayra Alvarez and myself. She as a fronteriza migrating from Monterrey and myself as a transfronteriza who has crossed every day the border. That was very important for us to adapt the both sides of the border and work from that perspective. This was a crucial principle in structuring back as a transporter arms project that will integrate a border region, sharing archives and binational communities, since it is important to rethink our habitat, home, city, country, world, not as a static place with people who enjoy fixed identities, but rather as dynamic territories and peoples with multiple identities as Castillo and Tabuenca mentioned, that is to say a fluid model region. So that took us in this image, you see the three newspapers from each historical period and that concentrates in locating 19th and mid 20th century newspapers from the past and current border region localized in various archives and collections in the United States, Mexico and other parts of the world. So if you just start looking at newspapers, you will find out a very fragmented perspective of the border. These newspapers are categorized under the United States or under Mexico without acknowledging the different content that represents both countries and particularly the border culture. By locating these primary sources from both sides of the border, it is possible to have a deeper historical and archival context of the greed and legacy of the border region that exposes multiple histories of the borderlands and its communities before and after the current dividing line was drawn. In period one, you see the Mississippi newspaper from 1808 published in New Orleans. And this is a newspaper that it's in Spanish and it's reporting news to the crown in Spain. The American Pioneer published in Monterrey, Nuevo León, it represents a newspaper, it's from 1847, and we're seeing an, a title in English. It was published in Mexico, and during that time, this, news, this particular newspaper was informing the US Army about what the Mexican Army was doing. The last one, La Patria, it's a newspaper published in El Paso, Texas, and it's mostly reporting news to a transporter audience. I really like the very, well, the nationalistic perspective that was imposed through this newspaper with the two flags and this international commerce. So to that said, by putting together the practice of locating newspapers from both sides break with the forms of the traditional archive that show a divided border. So that back creates an alternative collection that brings together archive, archival material from both sides to resist the reinscriptions of colonial violence. Within, in this image, this is the work of locating and putting the newspapers together as you see here, you don't see the division. It is all together that are 
interlock by the particular period, historical period, and then attach to the state where they were published. In this sense, we have the transporter archive understanding of these newspapers. Although what when we were creating the project, we wanted also to show the different geopolitical transitions, which in this graph, we're not able to see that and appreciate that. So that took us to use the digital map in order to map the newspapers from their particular historical period. Once the transnational data was collected, the idea emerged of a transporter archive, bringing together local, national, and binational history. The archive thus serves as an alternative tool to construct the notion of a fluid borderlands region. Using new forms of cartography, such as a geoanalysis tool, the transnational data was incorporated in a digital map to visualize the transporter archive. The creation of BACS digital map allow us to deconstruct the notion of a static repository and to decolonize the perception of the region utilizing a map. As Juanita Lucchesi mentions, it is important to create our maps with our own stories. And we did that with back. So in here, you see the map. And I invite you to go into the site and interact with the map. I'm going to do that in a moment. But BACS transnational data, digital transporter archive, and digital map serve as a tool to question colonial impositions upon the region. Its archive and its map that silence the binational history of the region as conventionally found in archival material, likewise challenges, establishes narratives, posing new questions that arise from the historical memory of the region, involving different moments and events. So in here, in this map, we also consider like we map the newspapers, but also we went into each of the newspapers to understand what the particular address to see where they were being published. And with this process of looking for the addresses, the incorporation of the addresses was crucial as it allowed us to maintain a historical record of the newspaper establishments and printing press locations in the border region. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you in the map some of what you can find. I'm here in the site within the map. We have located a total of 285 newspapers that are in digital format. There are other newspapers that are in microfilm or in physical format, and many others that are under other categories that we haven't localized. But within the search engine that you have in this period, you can start, for instance, take a look at the newspapers from particular period of time or from a state. So re in regards to time, I'm just going to like show you here how once you click to it, you're able to take a look at different information of the newspapers and see the movement that I was telling you. But moving forward, the last part, it is the facilitating newspapers. And this is because, as you see, these newspapers are distributed in different archives. And mostly a lot of newspapers from Mexico are in the U.S., a lot of newspapers in Mexico are not digitized, as well as many other newspapers require subscription in which they don't give you access to it. So this map, it's working towards providing a sense of where are those newspapers and knowing the grit and legacy of the border in order for us to know our history and recreate the history that has been taken. So this is part of what BAC works towards. And these are some of the sources where some of the newspapers are found out. And just lastly, I want to end up by saying how in the case of BAC, bringing personal knowledge are transfronteriza and fronterizas experiences together with archives and the maps, we're able to develop an alternative way of documenting the historical memory, locating, mapping, and facilitating access to the newspapers archives of the binational region. It's a way of repossessing our heritage by filling in the lagune in the official history 
and recovering a multiple legacy of experiences. With this in mind, it is important to recreate projects or initiatives that can tell the stories from our own border perspectives that can challenge the national or other impositions. I just want to show you in here some newspapers that are from California and Baja California. And for instance, this one, the California Star is from 1848. And once you go into the newspaper, it's very interesting because it talks about the problems with the territory when the New Spain was losing that part. In La Cronica, a newspaper in Spanish published in San Francisco in 1854, it's El Organo de la Población Española en California. So we see that presence of the Spanish Empire. The other, the, the two on the other side, it's the Imperial Press that was published first in San Diego, California in 1901, and then in, in Imperial California, and then the Periódico Oficial, Organo de la Jefatura Política del Distrito Norte de la Baja California, um, published in Ensenada in 1910. This one, it's available in the Emeroteca. So we're seeing different content from the newspapers that are available that can make us understand the intersectionalities that are present or have been present in the borderlands. Thank you so much. And I look forward to continue with this talk. Thank you to Bag for that great presentation. Thank you so much for your presence here and for the knowledge that you have provided to this panel. And so we are going to transition into our last panelist. So that would be Tom Holm, who is the executive director and principal science officer of the Kumeyaay Heritage Preservation Council, a coalition of Kumeyaay tribes whose vast homelands in Southern California and Northern Baja are divided by the U.S.-Mexico border wall. Mr. Holm is a lifelong activist dedicated to preserving cultural and natural resources. Welcome, Tom. I do want to start by thanking the California Lawyers for the Art. We're very happy to be a part of this program, and I especially want to thank you for that wonderful land acknowledgement that you did at the beginning of the session. So thank you for that. I took the title of this program and our host, literally, and wanted to combine both the political history and put art into the context of my discussion. The history isn't going to go back too far with regards to what I'll be talking about with the wall, but we are going to go back through history uh, quite a bit to talk about what has gotten us to this point. The border region that we're talking about is an area that I've been working at for a number of years now, and there are significant layers of art that are there. And I represent a group called the Kumeyaay Heritage Preservation Council. And the mission of KHPC is to prevent the loss and adverse impacts of the Kumeyaay heritage, spirituality, and cultural resources within the Aboriginal territory of the Kumeyaay people. And that includes art on all of these levels. Every form of culture that the Kumeyaay have that I've experienced is a glorious expression of culture. And I wanted to talk a bit about the, the ancestral homelands of the Kumeyaay, but not in terms of borders. The Kumeyaay have shared these lands with uh, other groups uh, along uh, the, the Northern Ridge and Eastern Ridge and to the South as well. But the instead of putting in border lines, I wanted to show just some of the Kumeyaay cultural sites that have been identified to show the concentration but also show the expanse of where the Kumeyaay territory once was and where their heritage remains. The Channel Islands are, are a part of that, as is the parts of northern San Diego County, even into southern Orange County, include, there's ethnographic history that includes that as part of their territory. And that area was later shared with other groups like the Luiseno, Waneno, and others. And I wanted to also show that in this map, I'm including paleo coastlines, which are where the coastlines were during the time of the Kumeyaay's occupation of the area. And the reason for that is the oldest human remains in, in the region, and in fact, within most of the Americas, they date back 13,800 years, and they were found on the Channel Islands. And the Kumeyaay are linked through DNA to remains from ancestors on the Southern Channel Islands. So this demonstrates, the map shows a demonstration of changing landscapes, but also it gives a little context for 
how long the Kumeyaay have been here. And I like to say that science is only now beginning to catch up with what the Kumeyaay have are always known. When I started studying archaeology 20 years ago, to say that there were Kumeyaay in this area four or 5,000 years ago would have been considered wrong in academia. But since I've been in this, in this area, I have found that the Kumeyaay's time here has gone back further, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000, or up to 13,800 years in the academic realm. In the Kumeyaay realm, it goes back, you know, time in memoriam. They've always been here. And to put things in context, if we go simply by the scientific comparison, the ancient complex societies that are viewed by Western academics show that, you know, medieval Europe goes back 400 AD, Let's see, your ancient China, 1850 before now, the ancient Mesopotamia, 3,700 years. Well, in context, that's just the beginning of time. That's current time and Kumeyaay time. They have been here and they've been introducing art and culture in a far more sophisticated manner than modern academia has given them credit for. We find evidence of ancient oceanic navigation dating back 10,000 years. We find trade, intermarriage, centralized governments, all going back 10,000 years. And by definition, that is what actually establishes a complex society. And so we're looking back on barriers that have been placed by modern academia that really those borders need to be taken down in time to go back much further in the Kumeyaay scope. So how has this remarkable culture how has this remarkable art and, and history and culture been treated by modern academics and modern scientists? And I'm using air quotes on that one. Well, one of the most efficient collectors was this Frenchman, Leon de Sazoc, who was able to gather a magnificent collection of about 4,000 specimens on his own. And the term specimen means skeletons. Those are Kumeyaay ancestors and ancestors of others who have been in this area. And those ancestors now reside in a curation facility in Paris. The woman on the right was actually considered environmentalist. Uh, when she went out to one of the islands that I studied, she noted that the human skulls were everywhere about. And at camp, the upper parts were used oftentimes as baskets when they were short of tins. They were actually using human skulls to store their food stocks. But back then they didn't know any better, right? Isn't that the excuse that we make for them? Well, what excuse do we have for what we're doing now? Collections that were made just recently include 2,000 Kumeyaay bowls that were found just off the coast of California. And the reason those paleo coastlines are so important to point out is because sea levels have risen almost 400 feet since the Kumeyaay have been occupying this area. Think about that. Off the coast of, say, La Jolla, the coastline would have been three miles offshore with the exclusion of the, the Deepwater Canyon that's there. But it would, would have been miles offshore from where it is today. There were thriving communities in those areas that had art, that had culture, that had wares like these amazing bulls. Well, 2,000 of those were collected from a submerged Kumeyaay site and they're kept in collection away from the Kumeyaay. And to this day, those collections are kept, the Kumeyaay heritage is kept from the Kumeyaay. Also recently, there were two chests, redwood chests that were found out on San Nicolas Island. The archeologists labeled those boxes as toolboxes and the contents of those boxes as tools. Why would they do that? Because if these were art, if these were cultural items, if they were used in any type of ceremonies, they would have far greater protections under U.S. law, which would require that they be repatriated back to the Kumeyaay or back to the associated, uh, most likely descendants. Instead, they're kept in a curation facility out on one of the islands. The boxes that I just showed you that are labeled by, by archaeologists and academics as toolboxes are labeled by local indigenous groups as the sacred bundle, and they're associated with the young woman that was actually out on one of the islands for 18 years. And that woman was immortalized in a book called Island of the Blue Dolphins, which was written by Scott O'Dell. I've worked with several regional tribes here 
to find a real name for that, that young woman. She's been called Karana in the book. She's been called the Lone Woman of San Nicolas Island, which is a horrible name for such an amazing woman. And the local tribe, the Luiseno, have given her the name Ahichimai, which in its full context means orphan songbird that no one can hear. She was on that island for 18 years alone. No one could hear her song. Additionally, illustrating this condition is that these amazing resources remain in curation facilities as some of the most prestigious facilities in the country away from the indigenous people and their, and their community, the descendants of those items. So how does that relate to where we're at right now and politics along the border wall? Well, this area is an area that we came across a little over a year ago. It's actually visible from Google Maps and from satellite imagery, which is pretty phenomenal. You can see that there's stacked rocks that go all around the perimeter of this 100-foot circle. And what dissects that is this border wall. And it's the new portion of the border wall. What's amazing about the desert region of both uh, you know, California and Northern Baja is that according to the director of the Imperial Valley Desert Museum, the deserts of Southern California, Western Arizona, and you should have mentioned Northern Baja, is that they're home to an extensive and elaborate network of earth and art, second only to the Nazca lines in Peru. So in context, if you think about the, the cultural heritage protections that are given to the Nazca lines and other UNESCO World Heritage Sites, they are phenomenal in protecting those areas. Here in, in our region, in the, in the Kumeyaay community, we have the second largest collection of these, of these geoglyphs that have no protections except what we're fighting for now. And if we're talking about if we're talking about art and law, we've been working for the last year very hard with our lawyers to combat the lack, the seem, seemingly lack of respect for the law to try to protect these sites. These are just a few examples of the geoglyphs that are found in Imperial Valley. These are fairly close to the Colorado River. And this is one of the sites that is very close to the border wall. This is in Acatillo, California, and it's so important to the Kumeyaay that they still continue to have gatherings at this site, as they likely have for thousands of years. And last weekend, a group of 60 young Kumeyaay people, along with their teachers, went out to this site, sang, danced, stayed up all night, played ancient Kumeyaay games, and they're, as, they're, as they're reinvigorating their, their culture at these sites that are endangered by the border wall. So this is another view of the site that I showed you earlier. You can see that there, there's this rock outline and kind of up to the upper right-hand corner, you can see a stack of rocks called Karen. Well, that stack of rocks is at the intersection of two ancient trails that may date back five, six, 10,000 years. We don't know yet. And now with the border wall, we don't have access to this unless we go through Baja. And so if anyone can help us do that, we would greatly appreciate it. So what was done with this remarkable World Heritage Site? I often get asked, you know, how did you come to be working with Kumia, with indigenous people, in protecting their heritage? My response is because this isn't just a, a cultural issue. It's a human rights issue, and it's a worldwide human issue. This is a world heritage site. It should be compared with the, the Nazca lines, the pyramids, Machu Picchu, Angkor Wat, and other sites of, of equal significance. But what's happened to this amazing site and the other amazing geoglyphs that we have in the area, which include just countless amounts of artifacts and other evidence of culture, of art, of gatherings, religious practices. Well, we tried to map out a lot of these sites and this is the site that we're looking at. And so the, the circle that you can see there is actually lopped off at the top. That line that you see going across is where the current border is. You can see that there are trails that run through that and there are arrows pointed to other circles that are sometimes called sleeping circles or dream circles, or even occupation circles. 
This concentration shows that this was likely a religious center where pilgrimages were made to mourn the dead, maybe to just a, a few hundred yards from here. There are cremation sites. All of these indicators are that this was a very, very important cultural site. And what you see in the swirl marks going through that are four by fours and ATVs that have gone in there and done donuts around this remarkable site, which is now bisected by this 30 foot metal wall. This is what that area looks like today. In addition to the wall, which in a lot of places was, a lot of placements was replacement for a past wall. And now they're digging through additional virgin territory to put in these trenches for optical, for lights, so that the whole area, the entire wall area will be lit, lighted at night, which affects local wildlife. And of course, it digs into miles and miles and miles of Kumeyaay cultural soils that are filled with thousands, if not 10,000s of remains of cultural artifacts and items that the world should not be losing. And they are. Were they taken to? Some cases we don't know. We're trying to track a lot of those down so that we can give those back to the Kumeyaay people. This area is actually an area that was cordoned off by law enforcement, but you can see that there are still tire marks going over. To the left is a cremation site, a known cremation site documented. Um, there's gatherings of lithic materials, which are stone tools, and those are just treated with no warrants or significance. This site here is a few miles from the border wall, but the reason it's so significant is in the foreground, you can see it's clearly a cultural site. You got groundstone mortars right there, this is one of the most sacred sites to the Kumeyaay people. And what's happening here is that they've now dug a well into the Hakumba water table. They're pumping that water out, putting it in these tanks, shipping the water to the border and using it to wet down the border, the border area. Okay, that's horrible in and of itself. But in addition to that, that is, that is sacred water that in the Kumeyaay's religion was given by the creator for healing powers. And for forever, people have gone to this area, including in modern times, for healing. I wanted to end on, on this note. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stan Rodriguez. I'm a Ipai Kumiai from the Santa Isabel Reservation here in San Diego County. We're here at the border and we want to bring to light the things that have been done, the damage that has been done. This land here, this is our holy lands and this is our duty to stand up for it. We have burial sites that have been cut through. These are our cultural sites. These are our spiritual sites here. These things that were done were done illegally. So what's going to be happening is a group of us Kumeyaay are going to be on this side of the border, and there's also Kumeyaay from Baja that are going to be on the other side. We're going to be singing our traditional songs, and what that lets people know is even though we have this border wall here, we are still the same people. Each song tells a story, and what this song talks about is before these borders were put up, before these walls were put up, that our people had free access. We came and went as we pleased from community to community. And this border for us, this is something that is just recent for our people, and we're not going to let that border wall stop us from being who we are. We're going to meet with the Kumeyaay in Baja. You ready? Okay, we're going to go. I don't like this door. You see here with the Kumeyaay in Baja, the culture, everything's still vibrant. My pecha! So even though these things have happened to our people, we're not defeated. We are coming together. 
This is a national call to action. Our history here is from time immemorial. We do it for our people. We do it for all people. I have to say that that was one of the most powerful days I've experienced in a long time uh, to, to see the uh, Kumeyaay United uh, at the border. And when I when I talked in the beginning about you know my history with the politics in the area, we've been fighting for the protection of cultural sites along the border region. And we have received good news that the border wall construction or destruction, as I call it, has stopped. And now we're working with our lawyers to protect that amazing art, to protect the amazing geoglyphs and, and other art forms that we found. And I want to give some credit to Colin Hampson from Sanofsky Law, Ted Griswold, Procopia, Mark Radoff, who's with the Sequan tribe here, Kumeyaay tribe, Michelle LaPena, and Simon Gertling from Rosette. They have come together to really help us uh, in this battle, along with the protesters, along with the others, to protect the Kumeyaay culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. And I wanted to just thank each of you for your contributions tonight. I think that I learned so much just listening to you. I know that 30 minutes seem to fly by for each of you. I wish we could just listen to each of you for an hour. I think that's always sort of the, the shortcoming with these types of things, because I think there is so many perspectives to not just this region, but the history and the legacies that you all mentioned. Tom, would you speak to the challenges found in reconnecting to severing nations' land? There are tensions for cultural supremacy, language, et cetera. Well, we're finding it difficult. The physical barrier, the physical barrier is causing emotional barriers. You know, people are, Kumeyaay in the South are afraid to come up into this area and confront, you know, what's the confrontations that are happening at the border wall, even if they're coming through, you know, one of the... Uh, uh, to, to visit relatives, there's, there's this level of anxiety uh, that's now in place. However, we're bringing down those barriers. And just today, I met with Stan Rodriguez, the, the gentleman that was in the video. And Stan is putting together an immersive language program where he's bringing Kumeyaay up from Northern Baja, who still speak the, the indigenous language, to come here and teach classes to the Kumeyaay north of the existing border. So there are methods that have been taken, there's challenges, but uh, there are a lot of good people that are fighting to get, get past those challenges. How is the shelter at the convention center different than other community run shelters or other government funded shelters? Uh, I think that, you know, the short answer would be they're all overcrowded because they're not designed to, to give, provide shelter for people. And they're all, you know, generally beyond capacity for, for meeting the needs in a sanitary and healthy way. So that would be my short answer. The opening up of these convention centers and these other public spaces is, is a, a kind of reaction to the crisis that, uh, of the U.S. government, you know, first under under Trump, and but now continuing, unfortunately, basically closing the border to asylum seekers, and the the crisis that's that's pushing people to seek asylum is only intensifying. So, so it isn't it isn't a question of how how in my opinion the question is restoring the right for people to come in under asylum laws, restoring that practice, and and allocating emergency resources to meet their needs to provide shelter healthy conditions and things that we would expect. We would expect, you know, to meet the needs of people in distress. Well, once again, thank you all so much. And I also wanted to thank the sponsors who supported this event, which are the firms of Hate, Brandon Bonesteel, Paul Hastings, Kahana Feld, and Shepard Mullen, who are panelists. I'm really honored and happy that you all were here to present and open the conference. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.